welcome. Um, the, the, the loose name of our talk is Where Am I and Why Do I Care? Uh, we're going to give you an overview today of geodesy and projections and, and hopefully give you an, an appreciation for this uh, this aspect of GIS that is sometimes overlooked because in many cases our tools will uh, make this easy for us. And I, I'm here to to, we, we are here today to share with you why you need to be concerned about this and to show you some of the things that uh, you want to watch for when you're working with spatial data, um, particularly when you're trying to get things to locate properly. We're going to present some information to help you understand the fundamental concepts for representing spatial data on a 3D or 2D surface. We're going to describe geographic and projected coordinate systems. Uh, we'll define geodetic terms such as geodesy, datum, and spheroid, and explain the importance of knowing the appropriate datum for map creation. And this is very important if you want to uh, present maps that make sense, but also perform spatial analysis. Uh, and that's an important concept there. And we'll also demonstrate some best practices for managing coordinates. So first of all, I'm going to get started with a section I like to call, what is geodesy and why do we care? Uh, it's a little play on our starting title. Uh, geodesy is the science of accurately measuring and understanding three fundamental properties of the Earth. It's geometric shape, its gravity field, and its orientation in space, as well as the changes in those properties over time. And that changes in properties, that's an important concept to remember. So this is a, re this is a, a, a um, definition from NOAA. Uh, there are other definitions floating out there. And um, basically what we, what we need to understand is geodesy helps us locate positions on the earth. Uh, and it helps us to spatially define areas and, um, and make sure that, the, that that information is easily shared uh, with other users and so that we can incorporate data from various uh, sources and have it all line up very well. Now, you may have seen a, uh, a view of the Earth in either one of these two formats. Uh, the one on the left is a nice flat representation. The one on the right is a spherical um, you know, Google Earth globe-like view of the Earth. Uh, and, and as you can see, in both of these representations, Greenland shows up uh, as a, a quite different and dramatically different uh, surface. So it turns out that how big is Greenland? The, the answer to that question really depends on how you look at it. So Greenland has an area of about 2.16 million square miles. Uh, if we compare that on the two maps here, um, it's hard to understand that those two features could have the same uh, the same size. Uh, and it's because of that representation of the projection on the on the Mercator, web Mercator projection on the left, which um, basically distorts some areas of the globe and only pre and only preserves uh, area, distance, and direction at uh, a few select locations of that projection. So looking at it on the right hand side from the global from the global or you know globe mode view, uh, this is not really a projection. It's more like a, 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 a closer representation to reality. Uh, but as I said, we get a different view of Greenland in both of those uh, situations. Now, if we're to look at the the quantitative question of how big Greenland is, the the image on the left shows you the the outline of Greenland over, superimposed over Africa in a Mercator versus an actual presentation. And so you can see that the size there is quite a bit different in the Mercator projection. And as I said, that's due to the uh, to the distortion that's built into that. Uh, the image on the right shows that Greenland object superimposed over several different continents, just to give you a, 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 a few other frames of reference uh, for understanding how big that, that uh, Greenland continent is uh, relative to the rest of the world. So our session today will explain why this apparent size disparity occurs, and it's going to give you a better understanding of how the spherical Earth can be represented on a flat plane. Now, another issue that we need to concern ourselves with is the alignment of of information on our maps. Now, this is a very important aspect of GIS. And uh, if, if we don't get a good alignment, we can have um, 
instances where we're performing analyses that aren't correct, or we're just presenting imagery that, that doesn't make sense to the viewer. Uh, here I've got a, a, an aerial image base map uh, that's superimposed with Paris Street center lines, and it doesn't conform. So there's a mismatch here between those two things. And so when we combine different layers from different sources, we want them to align properly. Uh, and, and understanding the underlying either um, geographic coordinate system or projected coordinate system that's inherent to the data that we're using as an important aspect of, of properly using uh, a GIS. Another issue that we can have is data from different sources, uh, not only imagery, but in this case, we've got parcel boundaries. Uh, the, the slightly tinted blue boundaries on the left-hand side of this image come from St. Louis County, whereas the greener um, parcels on the right-hand side come from St. Louis City. This is an area along the boundary, and you can see there's a mismatch between the edges of the parcels uh, defined by the county and the edges by the city. We'll talk about this misalignment more uh, during the demonstration. And I, I should mention that the, uh, the uh, misalignment with our aerial imagery, we'll all, we're also going to deal with that in the demonstration. We also want to accurately position point features. Um, if this is not done correctly, it can uh, lead to something that uh, Doris has uh, informed me is called the single dot of doom. I wasn't aware of this, and this is probably one of the more uh, interesting aspects of preparing for this demonstration uh, this week was, was learning the single dot of doom nomenclature. Uh, at any rate, point data is imported from tables uh, containing coordinate values. And so when an analyst brings that tabular information in and adds it to a map, uh, it's important to um, locate that data properly. And in this example, the data shown by the red arrow should be showing up in the near the St. Louis, the city of St. Louis. Uh, during the uh, demonstration sec section, we'll explain why that ha this happens and show how you're supposed to address this uh, appropriately. Now, I'm going to take a pause here and turn this over to uh, Doris, who's going to talk a little bit about defining positions on the earth. Um, just a caveat, if you're confused, you know, just um, realize this is a very confusing subject. And um, yeah, you know, um, feel free to ask, like, if you're just like, I'm lost, please ask questions in the chat window so we can address them. So next slide. So um, we have two types of coordinate systems. We have geographic coordinate systems and we have projected coordinate systems. So geographic coordinate systems measure angles from the center of the earth relative to the equator and the prime meridian at Greenwich. Now, one of the questions everyone asks, is there some significant reason why it's at Greenwich? No, <laughs> they just decided like the organization that you know started this up, they're like, we're going to start it at Greenwich, and that's that. So there is no like, you know, Greenwich is not like a special city. Maybe to the people who designate it to be so. So FYI, the angles relative to the equator are latitude values, and the um, angles relative to the prime meridian are longitude um, values. So um, the longitude goes like um, east and west, and then the latitude goes north and south. And these angles are measured in degrees, minutes, and seconds, and then sometimes um, decimal degrees. So now let's um, switch over to um, projected coordinate systems. So imagine this 3D surface, this ball that you, this sphere you see on the left, and it's flattened out to a 2D surface. And some projections use a geometric shape, which can be cut and unwrapped. So the three main types of projected coordinate systems involve projections onto a cylinder, cone, and plane. And coordinates and projective coordinate systems are usually measured in meters or feet from a point of origin. Um, next slide. Just to give uh, an example of where um, St. Louis is, which is 90 degrees. Um, and 15 minutes west and 38 degrees and 37 minutes north. 
Um, and as you can see, that measurement is coming from the center um, of the earth. So you have that earth's radius and um, you can see the parallels in um, the meridians. So that is how the measurement of like where St. Louis is in the geographic coordinate system works. Um, next. So now we have um, spheroid and datums. So spheroid, so the earth is not a perfect sphere. Um, it might look so like when you see your globes, but that is not the truth. It is actually a spheroid and it's, or ellipsoid, you know, those are used interchangeably and it's based on rotating on an ellipse. So the shape of the ellipse can be defined by two radii. So the longer radius is called the semi-major axis and the shorter radius is called the semi-minor axis, as you can see um, on the right. Um, in the past, a spheroid was chosen to fit one country or particular area. So a spheroid that fits one region is not necessarily the same one that fits another um, region. And these spheroids are computed using satellites and are considered very accurate. So now let's move on to datums. So we have our spheroids and now we have our datums, which is built on top of the selected spheroid and incorporates location variations and elevation. So with the spheroid, there's that assumption that there's a smooth surface around the world, but we know that's not the case. So the locum datum incorporates local variations and elevations. So all coordinate systems used for map making, whether it's geographic or projected coordinate systems are based on a datum. And this datum provides a frame of reference for measuring locations on the surface of an, on the earth. It defines an origin and orientation of latitude and longitude values. Um, the way to explain it is that a datum defines the position of the spheroid relative to the shape of the earth, while a spheroid approximates the shape of the earth. Oh my goodness, yeah. And so Dominic said that I think it's Greenwich UK because it's on the Thames and a good starting point for the British Empire seagoing navigation when this all began. Yeah, there, like I said, it wasn't, it's not like a magical point, like geographic wise, there's not some weird, you know, gravitational pull that makes everything accurate. It was chosen for like, they wanted it. They had a reason for their own organizational or empire building purposes. So thank you for mentioning that. I didn't want to muddle the story. I just knew that Greenwich was not like, it doesn't have any magic attributes. <laughs> um, so next slide, please. So now we have the spheroid and then we have the datum and now we have the geoid. And the geoid is a hypothetical surface representing the Earth's oceans would take if there was no land and if the water was free to respond to the Earth's gravitational and centrifugal forces. So the surface is approximately the same as sea mean, mean sea level, sorry. And it is perpendicular to the direction of um, gravity pool. So the resulting geoid is irregular, as you can see in this um, picture here, just it's not you know, smooth or anything. And it varies from a perfect sphere by much as 75 meters above and 100 meters below its surface. So, um, so when it comes to calculating um, elevation, it is the vertical distance of a point or object above or below a reference surface or datum. Um, generally means sea level. And this elevation refers to vertical height and land. But what you probably don't know is that there's many factors that come to just getting that one elevation of a mountain. So you have the ellipsoidal height, which is the elevation above or below the references um, um, ellipsoid when you like do the GPS, um, use the GPS receiver. So as you can see, it's that yellow line that goes to the top of that point measured. Then you have the geoid height, which is actually the offset between the geoid and the ellipsoid. And the height that um, the surveyors and field workers need are the orthometric height, 
So it is that ellipsoidal height minus the geoidal height. Um, next slide, please. So now let's talk more about the um, projective coordinate systems. So as I mentioned before, it's bringing a 3D surface to a 2D um, surface. So because of this, these projections always distort distance, shape, area, or direction. Distortion increases with distance from the standard parallel and projected coordinate systems can be cylindrical, conic, and azimuthal. So with cylindrical um, projections, um, if you look at the um, one on the top left, it's just, you know, think of just wrapping a piece of paper around the globe. So these projections preserve distance, but they distort size. And then you have conic projections um, in which is just think of wrapping a piece of paper in a cone shape around the globe. So this projection is good at preserving area, but area is more distorted as you get away from the standard parallels. So those, um, those um, east-west lines. Um, these can be, um, one or two parallels, which I will mention later. And then you have the azimuthal projections. So um, these projections are is pretty much putting a piece of paper on the north and south poles. So as a result, those are the best projections to use when mapping those poles. So these projected coordinate systems can either be tangent in which um, one line is there's one line of contact between the earth or the projected surface, surface or a um, secant projection, which has two, more, two or more lines of contact between the earth and its um, surface. So um, lines of contacts are the only places where projections do not distort any of the factors listed above. So in all the other projected areas, these distortions are going to become more pronounced as you move away from these points of contact. Next slide. So another projection that I want to talk about um, is the UTM projection, which stands for Universal Transverse Mercator Projection. So this projection was actually created by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, but when it was actually made, it was known as the National Imagery and Mapping Agency um, called NEMA. They adopted this special grid for military use of, throughout the world. So in this grid, the world is divided into 60 north-south lines covering a strip that is six degrees wide in longitude. So you have the zone starting from zone one between 180 degrees and 174 west longitude, and then progressing eastward to zone 60 between 174 degrees and 180 degrees east longitude. So in the context of the US, we are covered by um, 10 zones and it's east and measers. So um, you have um, some values called northings, which are measured continuously from zero to the equator in a northerly direction. And so to avoid negative numbers for locations south of the equator, um, NGA's cartographers assigned the equator an arbitrary um, value, a false northing, that's what it's called, of 10 um, million meters. So between each zone that you see here, there is a central meridian in the center of each zone. And that is the assigned an eastern value of 500,000 meters. So grid values to the west of the central meridian are less than 500,000 and to the east is more than 500,000. So that is a general overview of a UTM um, projection. Um, next. And now I wanna talk about state coordinates, plane coordinate systems. For me, I personally use this the most in my work. Um, they are actually defined in the U.S. by each state, and um, some states use uh, multiple zones. For example, in St. Louis, we're going to use Missouri East. 
if you say are on the west part of the state, so say you live in Kansas City, you're going to use um, Missouri West. And these are these state plan coordinate systems are highly accurate because um, they use surveying within each zone to measure these um, different um, distances. And so because um, they are highly accurate, a lot of surveyors um, use it. So these are actually provide even less distortion than UTM. So if I, so this is just one of my highly recommended um, coordinate systems to use um, if you're doing things on a state level. But again, that's really up to anyone, like what their preference is. Um, next slide. So um, one way to see the distortions in these projections is through Tissot's and Dicatrix. So this is a, um, so as I said before, map projections do all distort to some degree in terms of distance, direction, shape, and area. So all of these red circles do share the same radius, but you can see in this particular um, Tissot's and Dicatrix that um, and the Mercator projection that um, the scale distortion increases with distance from the equator. So it might be good for distance, but not so good in terms of scale. And you can just see this flat out because this is one of the mo most highly criticized projections that there is. So, um, so like I said, that the um, Mercury projection does preserve the direction and shape, but becomes more distorted with distance from the equator. And so, um, so um, pretty much like when it comes to interpreting this, just see how the surface, the circles change on um, various projections. And then they'll give you a various like idea of maybe what you wanna use for your own um, means. Um, next. So to show in another example, um, this projection, um, plate cutty, Kare, I cannot, I'm not very good at pronouncing <laughs> French words. Um, but this is pretty much a projection that you use across the world. And it is neither equal area or conformal. And so um, you're just pretty much showing global, um, a global view. So as you can see, um, as you move away from the equator, how distorted those circles become. Um, is this an indicatrix? Is this a tool? Oh, Dominic asks, is this indicatrix a tool available in GIS to evaluate a projection? I personally, I I do not know because I've never um if I wanted to look this up, I would probably look it up online. Bill, do you know? Um yeah, actually, Dominic, this the 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 way they make this is you you basically take a make a circular feature at the equator where it would have the the known area that you that you specify and then you just copy that feature and you can move it to different places on the globe and so in this case they've they've basically made you know 50 or so copies of this object and as they as it's moved from its normal location the distortion uh is basically in, is is displayed in in the object by virtue of its new position so the 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 inherent um, distortion in the projection is is basically evidenced by the shape the change of shape of that object. It's basically taking um, uh, multiple copies of a circle that has a radius of 500 kilometers and placing it at different locations on the globe, and then then the underlying projection actually drives this uh, distorting this, this process of distortion. That's why at the top of the of the map here you you can see the distortion of Greenland, uh, and you know obviously the the lines the uh, longitudinal lines which would normally come together in a point, um, in this case, they're all parallel with each other. And so at the top and bottom of the map, you know, you've obviously got the largest, um, the largest distortion, distortion possible because all of those lines should come together uh, on a perfect sphere. Does, does that answer the question? I can't see the chat window. 
Um, Dominic, is that good? Um, is that? Uh... Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay. And Gankamu says, are we studying surveying? Well, surveyors do take these things in consideration um, when they start surveying. Um, as I mentioned, in the context of the US, um, as if we are studying astronomy. Um, this is, do you want to tackle this one, Bill? Oh, uh, yeah. Could, could you read the question again? I didn't. So, I didn't... He, so Kamu asks, are we studying surveying as if we are studying astronomy? I'm a little unsure he, about. Yeah, I, uh, I think that actually brings up a, an interesting point to make. <clears throat> there, surveying is designed to accurately define positions on the globe. And, and particularly, you know, surveying is usually uh, interested in a small area, you know, whether you're uh, finding the lot lines on a parcel or defining the, the actual locations for center lines and in a, in a new road that's going to go in. So surveyors have a very um, keen interest in being very accurate. If you're going to put up a building, you obviously need to know um, exactly where that's going to go and what those proper measurements are. So that's a level of detail that um, GIS practitioners may or may not get into. It really depends on the kind of work that you're doing. If you're, um, if you're looking at global forest cover, for instance, and you would use a projection like this, you're more interested in not necessarily accurately um, to, you know, to a centimeter level showing the accurate distribution of things, but you're trying to get across a sense of how widely distributed something is like forest or desert or, or some other land type. And so a geographer has a, a different sense, I think, of um, the, and the need for positional accuracy. And, the, you know, as your, as your work gets to a, uh, a larger and larger scale or a smaller and smaller area, uh, it, it will depend more and more on staying accurate. So a lot depends on your particular application as to how, um, how important the, the actual spatial resolution or accuracy of any of these projections or um, coordinate systems would be. Does that answer the question? I'm, I'm just waiting for a reply, Bill. Okay. And then we have one other question sure. about how we can handle measurements that are across UTM zones. For example, UTM zone, zone 20, 35, in zone 36. Yeah, I mean, the the zone issue is um, a little bit complicated. I mean, right now the zones are are defined at the each one of the zones has a uh, a center meridian, like uh, Doris was saying, and you can design a custom, basically a custom projection that shifts that central meridian. If you were on the border between two of those. Um, zones, you would uh, you would likely want to design one that had a, a central meridian along that was closer to your center. And that gets us kind of back to the, the to the idea of these state plane coordinate systems. So they are designed to be very accurate within the area that they've been defined for. And so if I was working in a an area of the globe that happened to span two UTM coordinate uh, zones, uh, you would probably want to basically add in a custom projection that would more accurately match your area and minimize the distortion over your area of interest. In some cases, that might correspond to a state coordinate, a state plane coordinate system. A lot depends on the you know the the range of area or the extent over which your your study would be um, in, interested. Right. Yes, well tackled more so on the significance of accuracy, precision, and taking a survey measure, measurement. So yeah, Bill, you answered that question. Okay, um, good. Before, yeah. And yeah, I will just second that, Bruno. If UTM, that's the beauty of projections. <laughs> <laughs> that if the UTM, if you're having this issue, I would just choose another projection or make a customized one. Yeah, Last and we, we, can, we can talk about those parameters once we get into the demo. You know, because yeah, everyone, yeah. Um, next slide, please. 
So this is a projection called mall, mall weed, and it's also known as home, homolographic, babinet, or elliptical projection. So this is an equal area projection that displays the globe with, as an eclipse with axes, with axes proportional to, of two to one. So this projection is used approximately where accurate areas are required rather than accurate um, shapes or angles. Um, so um, this projection was first published in 1805. And then it was reinvented by Jacques Bavinet in 1857. Um, so this projection usually presents um, distorted shapes, angles, directions, and distances. However, as you can see, the points around the, the 40 degrees north and south at the center meridian does not have, um, they do not have distortion. So the bulging outward meridians do cause considerable um, distortion but near the projections um, edges. So um, the way you can um, min like um, reduce this um, distortion is to um, use something called a sinusoidal interrupted mall weed. So that replaces that central meridian with half meridians. So this type, so what, so what do you use this for? You probably ask. This is commonly used in small scale mapping and thematic maps to illustrate accurate area characteristics. So um, this is used to just show accurate areas as opposed to showing um, accurate shapes and angles. And then it can also um, show distributions of global um, data. So we have some more um, questions about um, like um, Bruno would like more notes on state plane coordinate systems. And I believe at the end, we will talk about resources that you can um, utilize for that. So I will leave that to Bill at the end. <laughs> Absolutely, that's, that's perfect. Um, next slide. So um, now we have a Tissot indicatrix for a single transverse Mercator zone. And so this shows the distortion that, it, that occurs from the prime meridian. So in the center, it's looking pretty good, but as you get away from that prime meridian, not so much. So this is why it's important to, um, oh, someone just made a joke. Is, someone said that Molly was Molly the person who made the Molly weed um, projection. <laughs> uh, uh, that was pretty good. <laughs> but this is really important on why you need to select your correct zone. Because this, this is like some people don't. And there has been issues like people don't like people making maps, choosing the wrong data on the wrong projection, all of this. And then accidents do happen. They do. So please choose the right projection based on your area of interest. And now we're going to show the last um, Tissot indicatrix, which is for the Buckminster. Well, actually, Buckminster Fuller created this projection called the Fuller Projection. Um, and this um, minimizes distortion across all regions um, of the globe. So there's just so many projections out there. So um, again, Bill's going to show some resources in which you can look up all of these projections and then some. Yeah, I, uh, I just want to interrupt real quick, um, Doris. So I, the reason that we included this fuller projection is because obviously it's, it's uh, aesthetically interesting. Um, you know, he designed this to basically avoid distortion on the land areas of the globe. And, you know, the, the odd shape that you see here actually lends itself to, um, uh, unfortunately, a visual aid that I was not able to get ready for this uh, 
for this presentation, but you can actually cut this shape out and form it into uh, almost like a dodecahedron that yeah. gives a, a representation of the Earth that gets a little bit closer to uh, the global shape that we're all used to. So uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a, uh, a visual aid ready for this one, but this was the reason I put it in here. Um, Buckminster Fuller basically gave a lot of thought to this to try and minimize global distortion in the land areas of the, of the globe. Uh, and on an unrelated note, like I've seen some kind of like some people producing like paper products in which people can fold this projection up. I don't know if you are familiar with that. Yeah, that's the that's the point I was making. You know, oh, the okay. lines here, if you and I've got a printout. And in fact, um, if if anyone's interested, I can find the PDF and send it uh, along the um, it's a PDF document that you can print out on, on okay, standard okay. paper and then uh, just basically fold up into sorry, sorry about that okay we no worries no worries <laughs> um i just wanted to um point out some very interesting comments in our chat window um francis says that for astronomy or planetary science unique geodet geodetic coordinate systems and projection have been created for all the solar system's planets mm -hmm. moons and some asteroids and some of these are supported in arcgis that's really cool i didn't know that Yes, that that's absolutely right. I've uh, I've worked with some of the folks, and June June and uh, Fang would would know about this. Um, they 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 use these types of projections for their Mars data. And then Kamu said, in Uganda, we use UTM projection. Some of us are never interested ourselves in knowing whether there are other types of projections. Thanks for this discussion. Yeah, no problem. I mean, even for me, I've lived in various states, so you know, um, the projection that I used when I lived in one state, you know, I was like, okay, I'm honed into that, you know, but then I moved somewhere else and I'm like, okay, got to use a different projection to make my maps. So yeah, it's just very important to have this discussion to know that there's a lot of projections out there. And yeah, if UTM doesn't work for you, don't worry, there's something that you can do about it. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then June gives a plus one about the planetary geodiptic ah, coordinate yeah. systems in ArcGIS. So now let's talk about, and we kind of started this conversation um, before when um, we had, uh, let's see who it was, um, Bruno um, ask a question about UTM. So yeah, how do we choose an appropriate projection? So first off, what is the purpose of your map? Are you going to do some kind of spatial analysis and show the results of the analysis? Or are you just wanting to um, show, like, like, you know, just put some points on the map globally? Like, if you're part of a professional organization, you want to show your world membership, you're just pointing points on the map. So, you really need to think what you plan to do with the map given the projections. So, because they can either preserve or distort area, distance, or shape. So then another question you want to ask, um, piggybacking off of that, is what's your area of um, interest? So projections are area specific as well. If you're making a map of Missouri, it doesn't make a sense to use a state plane projection that's for another state. And then finally, um, what scale are you trying to display? Are you trying to show the whole country or a particular section of it? Because that also will affect what projection you use. Um, next. And so if you're kind of stuck on what you should use, you can go to epsg.io and look up the projection for your area of interest. And then another thing that um, you should think, another point of consideration is that if you're working on a project team, sometimes these guidelines are already out there like there's a you know some kind of like guidebook for cartographic products um so please check with your project lead to see if there is a preferred projection because for example if you are a person that uses utm and that's the mindset you're coming into if you're new to this project but on the books it says you need to use state plane there might be an issue in terms of um 
yeah, like what the organization wants and what you usually use. And then finally, um, please choose a projection to preserve what you find is going to be the most important spatial element. So remember that's either shape, distance, direction, um, or um, area. Um, next. So one of the resources that um, Bill is going to mention is this um, summary of the map projections. So that is from the US Geological Survey, also known as USGS. Um, so this poster shows many different projections and it also includes this handy table summarizing the properties of various projections. So one recommendation I would have is if you really are just needing just a quick reference on what to like, if you're kind of stuck, um, print this out or save it as a PDF. And then before I start making your map, you know, ask yourself the questions that I mentioned before, and then use this um, poster to help you figure out what projection works best. And at that, I am going to hand it off to Bill, who will do the live demo on working with data in ArcGIS. All right, yes, live demo. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm slightly <laughs> afraid, but we'll we'll, hey, muddle we'll through, get this. through this. Yeah, we'll get through this. So um, I just wanted to give you a quick um, preview of what we're going to do in the demo. <clears throat> and then I'm going to stop sharing and uh, show uh, I'm going to stop sharing my my PowerPoint and start sharing my my screen. So first of all, I'm going to talk about viewing and setting the data frame coordinate system in ArcGIS desktop and also in ArcGIS Pro. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the coordinate system warning that you'll see in desktop. We'll talk about how you can check the layer properties to understand what the underlying um, spatial extent uh, or the coordinate system or projection uh, that's been assigned to that layer is. We'll talk about this uh, practice of setting transformations. Uh, and you'll see how important that is when you're dealing with data that comes in uh, in a different coordinate system from your, uh, your MAPS native system. We'll talk about how you can manage coordinate systems. That there are two major tools that we use in ArcGIS, uh, the, the define projection tool and the project tool. And then we'll talk about importing point data uh, to avoid that single dot of doom. And then we'll talk a little bit about how you determine the correct coordinate system for a data set that's been shared with you that may not have a, a, a coordinate system assigned to it. Um, you're looking at my PC desktop screen here, and I've got ArcMap loaded with a blank ArcMap system. And so I'm going to go in and serve up some data in the Geodesy Demo Data Geo Database. I'm adding the states layer. And this is a, uh, a layer of all the states in the United States. And it's brought this layer in and has basically placed it in my map. I'm going to bring in a base map layer just so we can have some context here. I'll use the topographic map. And so the state boundaries are overlaying the information that we see in the base map, uh, and it looks like an accurate overlay. Uh, this data set came in and was, was added to my um, my map document without showing any warning. We'll talk a little bit later about the warnings that you can get when you bring data in. But I wanted to show you a couple of things. First of all, each of the layers that you deal with, I'm gonna right click on states here and open up the properties. And there's a source tab that shows you information about the type of data, where it's located on your disk. And then it also has a section about the geographic coordinate system. And so in this case, it's been defined as a geographic coordinate system or GCS that's called WGS or World Geodetic System 1984. It's based on the WGS 1984 datum. It's got a prime meridian at Greenwich and the angular unit is degrees. And it also shows you up here in the extent, the, um, the east, west, north, and south boundaries, basically, in decimal degrees uh, for this particular layer. 
So every data set that you bring into ArcMap uh, or ArcGIS Pro for that matter, will have a set of properties that defines this uh, geographic coordinate system, or in some cases it will be a projected coordinate system, and it will say that here in this space. So I'm going to cancel that, and I'm going to go back up here to the layers tab in the table of contents. So the layers tab refers to the data frame in ArcMap. And the data frame has itself a defined coordinate system. And in this case, the first layer that you add to your map document defines the current coordinate system for your uh, data frame. And so in the data frame properties, we've got a coordinate system tab. And uh, I'm going to close my favorites here and just open layers. And you can see I've got two different coordinate systems in my map. One is this geographic coordinate system of WGS 1984, and the other is the, the geographic coordinate system WGS 1984 Web Mercator Auxiliary Sphere. And that is a projected data or a projected coordinate system using this Mercator Auxiliary Sphere projection. It's based on the same datum that WGS 1984 datum. Uh, but this is actually designed to show things in a flat space, uh, and that's why we see it uh, shown on our uh, a map that way. Now, I've just changed the data frame coordinate system, and I'm going to right click and zoom to my layer. And now it shows the data set, or the data frame, using the coordinate system of the underlying base map. So this is the base map coordinate system, and it's it's um, on the fly, it's projecting that state's data set into the data frame coordinate system. This automatically happens uh, when, you, when you work in um, ArcMap. In many cases, you won't even realize that this is uh, something that's happening. Although if you bring in a data set that has a different coordinate system, and I'll just bring this Paris Streets data set in just to to show you, you get a geographic coordinate system warning because this data set does not agree with the, the defined coordinate system for my data frame. This is a very important message. And there's two options here. First of all, you get a don't warn me again this session option or don't warn me again ever. I never check these boxes because I always want to know when I'm bringing a data set in that doesn't already conform to the to the coordinate system that has been defined for my map. When you're just dealing with things on a visual basis, it's not that critical that you uh, that you deal with this through the transformation process. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, but it is, uh, and I think it is important that you understand when this happens. Uh, and so I don't ever check these just so I, I always get this warning. You can always close it and the, um, ArcMap is going to automatically apply uh, some sort of reprojection on the fly to to allow to align your the mismatched data sets all to the same uh, coordinate system that's been defined for your data frame. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and minimize the ArcMap project for the moment, and I want to pull up ArcGIS Pro uh, because I want to show you a. a slightly different uh, behavior. So Pro is slightly different than ArcMap in that uh, when you add a map to ArcGIS Pro, you automatically have a base map added to it. And we have the same situation in the map uh, properties. The data frame has a defined property. In this case, it's the Web Mercator uh, projection based on the fact that, that that base map has already been added to my map. And I'm going to cancel that and go to my catalog tab. And I'm going to bring in the same states layer that I brought in before. Now, you'll see it's actually changed the projection of my map. And now it's applying the same projection that the state uh, or the geographic coordinate system that the state has been defined for that states layer. And it's already altered the um, coordinate system of the data frame. So Pro has a default coordinate system assigned, but as soon as you bring data in, the first data set that, that hits the, the, the map frame is going to define the, the default coordinate system. You can always change that in the map doc, in the, in the properties of the map uh, to whatever data, whatever coordinate system, whether it's a geographic coordinate system or a projected coordinate system. And I'm just showing in this view, 
<clears throat> excuse me, this, this view is very similar to what you would see in ArcMap. You'll have a set of projected coordinate systems, uh, which there are many. Uh, you also have a set of uh, geographic coordinate systems, and there are an equally large number of those as well. So you have lots of options here to choose from if need be. So I'm going to cancel that. And that has defined how we view and work with coordinate systems in ArcMap and ArcGIS Pro. Now, I did want to talk briefly, and I'm going to pull up the uh, properties here in just a moment. I wanted to talk briefly about this whole idea of uh, so many different uh, geographic coordinate system datums. So under the world setting, you can see for these for this geographic coordinate system, there are various um, uh, there are various G GCS or geographic coordinate systems defined. And down here at the bottom of the list, WGS 1984 has de several different what are called epochs. Um, and so the first version of WGS 1984 is is this one, and that was basically defined to begin to um, create a, a, a global coordinate reference system that's going to align with international standards. Since that time, there have been various revisions, <clears throat> excuse me, of the um, of the the WGS 1984 set. And this one, the 1762 is the latest one because these numbers refer to the number of months after they started doing the revisions that uh, that correspond to that particular version. Uh, the reason they make these different epochs is because, first of all, these are these, these are based on a geocentric definition or a spheroid that defines the shape of the Earth. And that is based on the center of mass of the Earth, the location of the surface of the Earth, and the, the tectonic plates therein, uh, and our ability to measure distances and areas and things like that. Uh, our methods have been improving. And so this is why we have over time been creating these new epochs. For a geographer like us, where we're creating maps at uh, a global or even a state level scale, these different um, accuracy levels are not going to be that that important. However, um, for a surveyor who's trying to take survey data with a GPS unit, it's, it, it is an important characteristic to be concerned about. But I just wanted to point out <clears throat> that there are many different um, uh, coordinate systems available. Uh, and as, as you may need one, they're, they're here for you. And the, the different um, epochs that you see for WGS also occur for NAT83. So under North America, there's a USA and Territory section. And you can see that the NAT83 datums have been improved. And for this datum, the this is designed to more accurately um, match the, the spheroid definition to the area of interest, in this case, North America. And so there are various um, known points that are used to tie the spheroid to uh, the surface of the Earth, uh, be benchmark positions, basically, that um, make these subsequent versions of this NAT83 datum more and more accurate. This HARN is the high accuracy reference network, uh, and that co corresponds to basically the, the highest accuracy um, uh, survey data that, that is available. So I'm going to stop talking about that for now. And I want to move on to the transformation issue. I'm going to minimize my pro and pull up ArcMap again. And I'm just going to start a new ArcMap version, the blank map. And in this case, I want to take you back to the example that I showed earlier of the imagery that wasn't aligned uh, in Paris. So I'm going to bring in a base map uh, for imagery. I add that to my map. And so that's setting the basic um, data frame coordinate system. 
Then I'm going to go out and grab uh, Paris streets. This layer is the street center lines for roadways in Paris. And it's coming in, showing me a geographic coordinate system warning that it doesn't agree with my data frame. I'm going to let that one go for now and just click close. And then I'm going to right click and zoom to those Paris streets. And then I'm going to zoom in on the Arc de Triomphe. And you can see here, I'm going to make this a little bit redder so you can get a better view of these streets. You can see that the misalignment here between the street network and the aerial imagery is not dramatic, but it's pronounced enough that it's, uh, it's definitely not correct. And if you were to present a map like this to um, your users, they would not appreciate it. And, and so we want to deal with that. And the way we do that is with what's called a transformation. So all of these geographic coordinate systems are mathematically defined. And there are mathematical equations or transformations that allow you to convert from one, uh, from one of these to another. And there are lots of different ways for this transformation to occur. There are three parameter transformations, and they basically shift the x, y, and z axis locations um, to better align the geographic coordinate systems. It's a very simple shifting of the datum to accommodate a new location. Uh, there are also seven parameters that involve shifting, rotating, and scaling uh, those particular uh, properties. We, we also have what's called grid-based transformations. And although you might in, uh, assume that this is like a raster grid, uh, it's not. Um, I, I honestly don't uh, have any more details than that as far as the grid based goes, but it does for a specific area, it does a very careful transformation between coordinates in one coordinate system uh, to another. So how would we deal or um, choose uh, a transformation for this particular area? If, if we open up the map document properties again and go to the coordinate system tab, this shows us the coordinate systems that are in use in our um, uh, in our map. So I've got that NTF Lambert 2, I've got the Web Mercator sphere. Um, and right now I don't have any transformation defined between those two. There is a box here that allows me to access this transformation settings. And so right now, converting from this NTF geographic coordinate system to the WGS 1984 system has no um, transformation defined. If you click on the down arrow, it gives you options for the particular area that you're viewing in your map document. So as you can see, there are a large number of different choices that could be made to convert these two coordinate systems to agreement. Uh, but the, the beauty of this system is for ArcMap, it orders these in, um, in order of appropriateness. So the more accurate the more accurate um, conversion is going to be at the top of the list. We'll select that one. It shows us it's using this NTV2, which is actually one of those grid-based coordinate uh, conversions uh, to convert the NTF coordinate system into the WGS 1984 system. So I'm going to click OK to choose that transformation. And then I'm going to move my window over and I'm going to click Apply so we can kind of see what happens. When we do that transformation, the line work actually much better aligns with the street center lines in the, uh, in the area of interest here. And so visually speaking, I've transformed, uh, I've, I've, I've better defined the on the fly transformation that occurs um, in this uh, situation. And, and Dominic, I see your question. How do you choose which layer to transform? Um, I would transform from whatever um, odd coordinate system into the coordinate system you want to use for your map. Um, so in this case, because I because I chose a base map that had a Web Mercator, or I'm sorry, that had this WGS 1984, uh, yeah, it's the, the Web Mercator uh, coordinate system, I'm going to transfer it to that one. If I was working with Paris data, for instance, and I wanted to um, bring in other data from, you know, maybe the, the uh, parcel boundaries or the counties from, from France that I wanted to add to this, and they all happen to share that NTF Lambert 
coordinate system, I would likely do the, do a different transformation. I would um, I would do the reverse transformation. Um, okay, for a nation which transformation works best, it the transformation depends on where you are in the globe. And Bruno, I'll get back to to that in more detail in a little while because there is a large PDF document that um, that carefully defines where the appropriate trans transformations are. And, and as I said, this is a mathematical process. And of course, we're dealing with datums and spheroids that are defined for the entire globe. And so uh, a, a transformation that might be appropriate for North America may not be appropriate for Africa or a country therein. And so it is important to make sure you're using that correct transformation. The um, the choices that were presented to me here in this transformation box are all appropriate for the European area. So many of them are, are uh, specific to Paris or to Europe. And, um, and so the, the, the listing here is kind of um, giving you a subset of the larger list of transformations that might be available. So I'm gonna cancel this and cancel that. And um, I think I'll talk here just for a second about the idea of the, uh, can you measure the transformational error? Um, well, that's an interesting question, Bruno. I guess, um, I, I, I assume it's possible, um, but I can't answer how you might go about it. Um, the, the question I would say is, um, are you going to assume that the aerial imagery is correct or the street networks are correct. And, and I would argue that there's a uh, there's probably a bit of uncertainty in both of those, although the, the street networks might be defined with a survey instrument where um, you, might, you might have more confidence in their locational accuracy. Um, let's see, so I, I, I did wanna say the transformation that we have just applied basically gives us a transformation that allows our display to show the data in its accurate location. If we want to create a data set that actually has a coordinate, a different coordinate system, then we need to use the projection tool uh, or the project tool. So I'm gonna use my search box here and just pull up project. And there are the two tools I mentioned earlier the project tool and the define projection tool uh, operate a little bit differently. Sorry, I didn't get the rest of that in there. So the project tool takes uh, an input data set and then converts it into a new data set by performing a mathematical transformation to the new coordinate system. The, um, the projection on the fly that we've done here in our image or in our map is a uh, basically a temporary fix. Uh, and it works great for the display, but if I was going to perform some analysis and I wanted to um, have a common coordinate system for all of my data, I would wanna make sure I use the project tool to create a new data set. So for this uh, data management project tool, I'm gonna open that one up. And my input data set, I'm just going to take the pair of streets. And the output coordinate system, I'm going to select this, um, the one from my web mercator so that it's going to match up with that. I'll click OK. And the transformation that it's already selected is the one that I have transformed that, that I'm using in my um, display. And so this is going to create a brand new data set. And I want to make sure that I um, put this in my home. Actually, give me just a second. I want to browse to my desktop demo. And I'll just put this in with the Paris streets. Instead, I'm just going to call this web Merck. So I'll save that. And so now I'm, I'm creating a new copy of my data set that will have uh, that native coordinate system assigned to it. And then I'm gonna click okay, run that tool. I'll close it. And it's already brought that data set into my map. Um, I'm gonna go back into my data frame here and to my transformations. And I'm going to convert back to none. 
and I'll click OK and OK. And now I'll make my other pair of streets visible using a slightly different color so we can see this. And so the the original Paris data sets have, have returned, the red lines have returned to their offset because we don't have the transformation applied, but the lines that I created, the green lines, uh, they agree with the coordinate system that's defined for this data frame. And so they're lining up properly with that imagery. Does anybody have any questions about that, uh, that process? Um, yes, is there a method to find EPSG system definitions other than ESRI, I assume is what you mean. And yes, if we go to um, our uh, transformations, actually, no, I'm sorry, the, the EPSG systems um, define different coordinate systems based on a numbering system. Um, hang on, Bruno, I'll get to that question in a second. And so in order to do that, you would need to search for a um, coordinate system. And uh, I believe that if EPSG, in fact, it's shown, uh, yeah, here is, in, in for this particular web mercator, the EPSG code is given as 3857. If we were to use a different, um, a different coordinate system, it would have a different EPSG number, which is 32662. And so I think I can use the search box up here to, um, to find that. And actually, it looks like I'm wrong about that. So um, actually, uh, Dan, I guess it's Dan. Um, Sorry about that. I don't know exactly how to, to search using an EPSG definition in the um, data frame properties here. I know that you can look up the system definition and that number uh, is usually associated with this well-known ID, the WKID number, which is um, given for the other projections that we typically use. But unfortunately, I, I'm, I, I'm not prepared to demonstrate that for you today. Uh, but I do know that the, the EPSG definitions are included in the embedded uh, data that's that's included with ArcGIS. Now, Bruno was interested in what's the difference between the green and red lines. Um, so I'll just uh, go back on that for a second. The red lines are the original Paris Streets Network data set. Uh, and those were defined with that NTF geo geographic coordinate system. The green lines are the same features, but they have been converted into the Web Mercator WGS 1984 geographic coordinate system. And so the features are the same. They just both have different coordinate systems. They're both accurate and appropriate. It, the reason that they don't agree when we show them in this map is because the transformation is not uh, being applied properly. So let me get to a couple more questions. Is there a chance to transform a coordinate system for a shape file without having two layers in your arc map? Yes, there is, Stella. So um, to go back to the um, project tool, when you when you use this tool, um, you, your your drop down menu gives you access to layers that are already loaded in your map. But there's a browse tool here also, and it allows you to get to anything on your drive. And so you can you can pick a data set that's not in your map, and actually Arc Catalog would would give you access to this toolbox, uh, and you could do it without even visualizing the data at all. And so you could pick an imp, a, a, an input data set, and then of course set your output coordinate system to whatever you wanted it to be, and uh, and and run the tool that way. And so Dominic asks, is it better to transform for temporary display only and project changes in the actual underlying data? Um, Dominic, sorry, I'm I think sorry, not, not, not if it's better. I just, I, I put the question earlier and I thought I, fr I phrased it better this time. Ah, is, the okay. is the transform um, move a temporary, what's the difference between transform and project? Because it seems like it's accomplishing the same thing, but is, is transform just like a temporary change for display only and project actually changes the underlying data? You, you are correct. So um, yeah, transform is just gonna give us something that is appears in our map view, 
correctly. If I was going to do some analyses, you know, maybe I wanted to find, and as, particularly if I was using a couple of different layers, maybe I've got uh, a county boundary layer or a, a state, maybe I have a state layer and uh, a layer of interstates. Uh, highways, and I want to find out how much of each, you know, what are the distance for each interstate in a given state. So I, I'm trying to do a, a spatial analysis by overlaying those two uh, data sets and doing a, um, a quantitative analysis. I want them to both be in the same projection so that their accuracies are the same and so that they align properly so that the boundaries of the state would be uh, in their proper location associated with those, um, those uh, state boundaries. So in that case, I would want to project my data first so that I have a, a data set that actually conforms to the common geographic coordinate system I want to use for my analysis then that then I would perform the analysis. If in fact all I wanted to do was make a map showing the states and the interstates, at the scale of the United States, the accuracy is not going to be that important, right? The spatial accuracy. And so I could use the transform properties here, make my map, uh, output it into a figure or whatever I wanted to do with it, and, and leave it at that and leave my data set in its native format. Does, does that answer the question? Yes. So if okay. it's a stat, if it's a static printed map, then transform would be good enough. Then yeah, yeah. But if you're trying to do analysis, you definitely want to work in this in a common coordinate system for all your layers. Why? Why would um, I mean? Maybe this isn't important, but uh, the, how? Why wouldn't you be able to do analysis with the transformed information if it's the transformed information? is solid enough to project it correctly, why wouldn't it also have that, be able to use that same data to do the analysis? Yeah, that gets into a deeper software question that I can't answer. And so um, I, I cannot tell you that when the uh, buffer tool, for instance, goes in and finds all the vertexes, that it's going to buffer with a certain distance. I don't know if it's, if it's using the transformed coordinates for that vertex or the original data coordinates for that vertex. Does that make sense? Yes, thanks very so, much. Yeah, so it's kind of an unknown situation. I I cannot tell you that it would not work correctly, but it would take some uh, a little bit of uh, effort to, to, to figure that out. Great, thank and you. So let me go back to Bruno. Did that answer your question, Bruno? Um, not yet. Okay. So um, I guess, could you be more clear about what it is the, um, the I, I mean, I will, um, I will go through that again. The, the red lines, the, the red and green lines both represent the streets in, um, oh, you want the distance difference. I can, I can measure that for you. So I'm just zooming into an area that's a little bit closer here. I'll just select a point on this uh, distance or on that particular line and it looks like it's 0.8 kilometers. I'm sorry, 0.08 or 0.08 kilometers. Yeah, is that what you're looking for there, Bruno? Great. And then uh, Stella, did, did I answer your question about the uh, transforming without having two layers in the same map? I, I think I did, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving on. But if I didn't, please uh, speak up and I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay. So there are other more complex transformations. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back to um, a clean version of ARIC map here. 
Uh, the reason I'm doing this in ArcMap as opposed to ArcGIS Pro is uh, ArcGIS Pro makes some of the transformational choices for you automatically and ArcMap does not. And so I, I, I wanna do this in ArcMap so that it highlights this issue. Um, and we will get into Pro here in just a minute and I'll, I'll show you a, a demonstration in that. Okay, so I've got in uh, a slight example here, I've got four different um, data sets that represent streets in Broward County, uh, Florida. So I'm gonna take all of these guys and I'm just gonna bring them in one by one. Actually, I'll get the rest of them all at the same time. I'm gonna ignore the transformation issue here, but all of these are in different coordinate systems than this Broward Geo 27 layer that I brought in. So I'll close that. And then I'm just gonna zoom in to an area here that we can see that this is quite a mess we've got going here. So I've got four different layers and the closer I get, the, the more obvious it is that these things don't necessarily agree very well, okay? We've got certainly some differences between this GO27 layer and the other GO83, GO84, and HARN layers. So um, I'm gonna go into my layer uh, and my coordinate system transformations, and you'll see that the, um, the uh, data set for the map is set to this GCS North American 27, which was the first layer that I brought in. And then for each one of these other layers, the NAD 83, the NAD 83 High Accuracy Reference Network and the WGS 1984, there are no transformations associated with those as yet. The NAD 83 and the 27, you'll see, I'm gonna close this for just a second because you'll see that the NAD83 layers are the um, green layers and they all are relatively closely in agreement with this HARN layer, the blue layer. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit closer here so we can see there's not an exact agreement. If we get close enough, we'll see that there are one, two, three, four different lines representing that highway. So there is a slight difference between the locational accuracy or, or the between the locational position for each one of these things because of the difference in the coordinate system that, that's being applied here. So I'm gonna come back up to my transformations. And for each one of these, I'm gonna go ahead and apply a transformation and we'll see how that works. So for 1983, converting into the 1927 datum, I'm gonna use this 1927 to NAD83 NADCON. That's another of those grid-based coordinate system conversions. I'll click OK, move my box over a little bit, and I'm going to hit apply here. And one of my lines is going to disappear because it now lines up with the um, with the, the, the GEO 27, which is the one that's in the native coordinate system, is now hidden behind one, the NAT83 data set because that uh, transformation has now been applied. So let me go back and hit another one. I'm gonna do a HARN transformation. And you'll see this one is actually a, a, um, a, a transformation that's transforming from 1983 to HARN Florida, and then from 1927 to 1983 NADCON. This is a, um, a two-part conversion. It's a complex conversion moving from one, one coordinate system to an intermediary coordinate system, and then to the final coordinate system. So I'm gonna apply that one, click okay, and whoops, I didn't mean to click okay, but one of my lines has disappeared now. I'll go back to my transformation window, sorry about that. And I'll hit the final one, which is the GCS WGS 1984. And I'm gonna translate that using another complex or multi-part uh, conversion here, which will be this one. And this is using a, uh, a different composite transformation. And then I'll click okay and apply there. And now I'm down to one single line, but it is in fact, all four of these lines. I'll have to close this to show you, but each one of these cases, the GEO27 line is there, the HARN line is on top of it, GEO84 on top of that, 
GO83. So now all of my coordinate systems are aligning properly because the transformation is um, properly associating or properly adjusting the underlying datum to agree with uh, the with the common datum that I'm applying here, which is the one, the, the NAD27 that was applied at first. Um, Bill, Dominic yes, has Doris. a question. Excellent, thank you, Doris. Hi, uh, yeah, is this, because these are roadways, um, is, is this a good example of, uh, can we assume that they're all relying on the same highly accurate survey data that the say the highway department would have used but it, so is this a good example of uh, like identical data uh showing up differently on a map because specifically because of the coordinate uh, projection that is being used um yes and um dominic i'm going to pull back the curtain uh, the wizard of oz behind the curtain says um <laughs> this is in fact the same data so the same data has been projected into each one of these different uh, coordinate systems. And so it's accurate in that it's basically all the same data uh, and it's represented in a different coordinate system and has been mathematically transformed into that system so that each one of the vertexes is, um, it, it has the same coordinates. The reference system is slightly shifted because of the um, the accuracy and the level, or I'm sorry, the accuracy and the and the area over which those coordinate systems are most accurate. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, so that is the um, that is the example in ArcMap, and I wanted to do that also in Arc Pro. So I'm going to open up a new map in ArcGIS Pro. And just for demonstration purposes, which I guess that's why we're here, right? I'm gonna take those four layers and bring them in and do the same exercise here. So I'm gonna zoom in to that region where all the highways come together. And sorry, my mouse work is not as on my uh, touchpad here is not as careful as it might be. But you can see here that these are all aligning very properly with each other. So I've got four sets of lines in the in the map and they're all one on top of the other, right? So um, what's going on with that? The, the answer is that Arc GIS Pro, and I'm gonna open up the, um, the data frame properties here, ArcGIS Pro automatically assigns a transformation as I bring my data into the map. So in, in the map properties, I've got my coordinate system panel. I've also got a transformation panel. And um, so in this case, you can see that for NAD27 to NAD or to WGS1984, there is a conversion here that's been applied, this, this number three conversion. Uh, NAD27 to NAD83, NADCON has been applied, and this NAD83 to Harn, Florida is applied. I'm just going to click on details here to show you that Pro gives you a little bit more information about the transformation than you see in. Um, than you see in the arc map option. And I'm gonna maximize this so we can kind of see what's going on here. It shows the transformation path. Uh, it shows the steps that are involved and it shows the accuracy of those steps. So in this case, I've got a two-step process here. I'm transforming from NAD83 to Harn, Florida with a 0 0.05 meter accuracy. And then down below, I'm transforming from NAD27 to NAD83 NADCON, and I've got a 0.15 meter accuracy on that one. It also shows the method of the transformation. In this case, it's a NADCON. In this case, it's a HARN transformation. And it shows the area of use for each one of these uh, transformations. This is for Florida. This is for the co conterminous United States. Uh, and so the different transformations are going to have different um, areas of use. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to point out is I'm going to cancel. Well, actually, yeah, let's cancel this. So 
looking at this map, we see there's a disagreement between the um, the base map, which shows the topographic topographic features, and the line work that's not exactly lining up on top. Okay, there's a slight shifting here on this curvature that that isn't. Uh, that isn't matching well. Um, and I can tell you, I think it's due to the transformation that's been applied. Um, whoops, the transformation that's been applied to this uh, NAD27 layer. And the, the reason I know that is because there are lots of different transformations between NAD27 and uh, WGS 1984. And the one that it's chosen here, this number three is appropriate for um, the, the whole uh, North America basically, but um, number four and actually number five are more appropriate for the coterminous United States. So I'm going to go ahead and click that and run that transformation. And now you can see my lines align a little bit better with that underlying base map data. Now, the reason that that number three um, transformation was applied is, and I'm to be honest with you, this is my uh, my uh, educated guess. Uh, I believe it's because we're dealing with a, a global layer and a very local layer. And so it's trying to find the best match between those two things. And that's why it picked one that was more generic. When we go in and get a better, uh, better one as associated with one of our layers, which is the, the road network, we get a, a better agreement with that. Okay, can one change, this is a, let's see, Bruno says, can one change the interpolation method in the transformation steps? Okay, Bruno, now you're, you've, you've taxed my uh, skill level uh, beyond uh, the bounds. Um, you know, it's a mathematical process. The um, transformations that are applied in ArcGIS are built in, they are, um, you know, industry standard or, you know, academically developed standard transformation uh, equations. You can, of course, do your own interpretation interpolations. I'm going to refer you to some websites at the end of the talk that the NGS website, in fact, might have some more information about how you could create a custom interpolation method. Um, but that would be, you know, something that uh, would be beyond my skills. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that for you there. I did want to show a quick example from the St. Louis area. So I'm bringing in a parcel layer from St. Louis City. And I also have a St. Louis County parcel layer. So these are two different layers. And in fact, I think they both have different coordinate systems. This one has a NAT83 State Plain Missouri East coordinate system for the St. Louis County parcels. And the parcel layer has a 1927 State Plain Missouri East coordinate system. Now, let's see here. Sorry, I'm gonna pull this up one more time. So the NAD83 coordinate system is based on that uh, NAD83 datum. The parcel layer has a NAD27 data set that's based on a NAD27 datum. And I'm gonna go back into my properties here for my transformations. And I've already got a NAD83 to NAD27 transformation built into my map. This is why when I brought two layers that disagreed with each other into the map, it didn't throw the error because the transformation was already applied. I'm gonna cancel that, cancel this. And the point I wanted to make with this is that if you zoom in to the boundary between the two areas, there are some places where the, um, the maps uh, or the parcel data is not lining up properly. And some of this might be due to uh, a disagreement in coordinate systems, but we've got our transformation taken care of. And so one of the reasons that this data doesn't necessarily agree is because the, the underlying data sets, the county data and the city data don't um, don't don't play play nice with each other, I guess is a, a good way of putting it, in that some of the parcels are are defined uh, and drawn in in each of the each of the two layers. And so we get this combination deal where um, I'm going to remove the fill color here from the green one. 
and I'm going to remove the fill color from the other. And I'm going to also change the outline color so that we can see it. And so we can kind of see that there are areas where this does not compute. There are overlaps where the, the parcels have been defined di differently by each one of those municipality entities. And so transformations will get you um, into agreement, but it will not take care of uh, errors in the underlying data sets or disagreements in the underlying data sets in this case. This, uh, this factor here is locally known as the, the zipper, where the, the things don't necessarily align, but they kind of overlap a little bit along the edge of that St. Louis City County boundary. didn't. So one thing that I would do to, to address that issue would be to um, pull in a, an under, another layer to kind of be a, um, uh, an arbiter. And so here I'm going to add uh, a standard topographic base map layer. And then I'm going to kind of look in to the area where I've got city parcels and I've got county parcels. And here the streets underneath are lining up pretty well with both layers. So in this case, my uh, my you know standard uh, of the the base map is agreeing with both of the layers, but it's in between where they both inter interleave, where the disagreement occurs, and that's kind of what I would uh, that's what I would say would be the the the. The reason I would I would say that the parcel layers are accurate is just that we've got a, a disagreement between municipalities here. So, um, here we've got a set of schools and I'm going to turn on this layer. Uh, Mark has uh, a project that he deals with St. Louis County schools and so he's he's constantly mapping school data uh, and um, and showing these features. Well, he's got a, a layer for or a data set from 2013 that uh, showed schools in the Missouri area. And he wanted to bring in some new schools from the St. Louis area to, to add to that, to basically update with some new information. And so he, he had a table. And if you bear with me just a second, I'll show you the table. It's also included in the um, it's included in the download folder that I sent you guys. So it's a table that includes uh, a name of the school, a latitude and longitude, and some other information about the school. So you can add X, Y data like this to a GIS project by uh, including a set of coordinates, in this case, latitude and longitude, but in other cases, you could use UTM coordinates or any other set of coordinates uh, that you wanted to include in your table to locate where you wanted your points to be. So I'm going to minimize that for now, and I'm going to come back to my map. And so he added those schools, but I don't see them in my map. Maybe they're under maybe they're underneath the 2013 schools. Uh, it turns out they're not because they should be showing up right here. So I'm going to zoom out to the full extent of my map, which basically shows me all of my data. And you can see I've got my my districts in Missouri, uh, and then I've got this single dot of doom down here. Uh, I'm going to bring in a base map just to give us some context. And this is floating off of the coast of South America, um, not exactly where we had hoped it would be. So I'm going to close that. And so here is our, our school data. And if I zoom in on that particular layer, I can see that as I get closer, my single dot of doom is going to turn into uh, a blob of dots. And I have to get pretty close to this. But there they are. So now I've got a blob of dots uh, representing each one of the features in my table. And I, Bruno, I'll get to that question in just a, in just a bit. Um, so the, uh, the points themselves have loaded into my map, but they're not locating in the right place. So let's go back and look at the schools layer. And in the source tab, I can see that they've been defined as having a coordinate system of NAD83 UTM zone 15. Uh, and that is actually not a latitude and longitude or geographic coordinate system. This, this, these should have coordinates defined in meters in the, uh, in the range of millions or hundreds of thousands uh, for the X and Y values. And so um, 
I can tell that that's, that's not the coordinate system I should be using. So I'm gonna zoom back up to my other layer, to the Missouri area, and I'm going to uh, close my Excel spreadsheet so that I can bring that into my map. And let's see. Desktop. So here's my latitude and longitude table. I'm just gonna bring in the, the table and I'm gonna right click and open it. And we'll see that I've got my latitude and longitude values here. I'm gonna close that. And then I'm going to right click on the layer and display XY data. So this is the process that you use to get those um, values in. And it's automatically, it's tuned to find, you know, X and Y values or latitude, longitude, that sort of thing. Longitude is an X field, latitude is a Y field. But the key step here is this coordinate system of input coordinates. So it's taking the data frame coordinates system and saying, this is probably what you're bringing in. So I'm gonna apply that coordinate system, which gets us this uh, NAD83 UTM zone 15 North coordinate system, but that's not what my data is in. So I need to use the edit button here and I need to define that this is in WGS 1984. So I'm going to use the um, I'm going to use the search bar here, and I'm just going to type in WGS 1984, do the search, and the way this works is it pairs down the list of options. So everything that has WGS 1984 as part of it will show up in my list here. So I don't have a long list of things to kind of work through. I do now have all of the potential li links here. And I'm just going to cl click this WGS 1984 option and bring that in. And now I'll click OK. And it's giving me this object ID field. We can ignore that. So now my points are appearing in the right place. Uh, they're going to overlap with the, the other school points just right. And so now, the, you know, the, the step here to be careful about is to make sure you understand the coordinate system that your data set should be in so that when you show it uh, or when you import it, you can bring it in uh, properly. Um, so I'm going to take a quick aside. Bruno, um, for orthophotos, the transformation is done based on the idea that that ortho photo is a raster image. And it is always going to be a projected data in, in some sort of projected coordinate system because it's basically a flat representation of the of the earth. And so raster images have a defined coordinate system just like our vector data does. Usually it's the upper left or lower right corner has a defined coordinate and then the size of each pixel is defined uh, for the system to understand how to display that. The, the coordinate uh, transformation would occur in the same way in that each of those cells has a known location. Uh, and so it would, it would transform those things uh, using that sort of uh, a process. But the, the equation that would be applied would be this, the same one for any of the other trans, transformations. Instead of working on a vertex by ver vertex basis like it does for vector information, it would work on a cell by cell basis like it does for a raster image. So I have one more demonstration item that I want to, to work with. And so I'm going to open up a fresh map in my Arc Pro. And I want to talk about how do you deal with a data set that you don't know what the coordinate system is. So in my catalog, I've got a data set, the CC buildings underscore UNK. So I'm going to bring that layer into my map document. And this is a set of building footprints. So I'm going to right click and zoom to this layer. And I can see I'm going to zoom in a bit on this. So we can see these are footprints. And they're from Canyon Creek in California. So I've got a whole bunch of building footprints here. And if I zoom back out a bit, we'll see that um, I don't think we're in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. This is actually um, Northern Africa. So my data is not showing up in the right place. And um, I actually ignored it. A warning would have popped up over here that I brought in a data set. Let me actually redo this so I can uh, show you. We should get that warning here because Arc 
Pro has a slightly different method of reporting the warning. It appears up here in the corner and it's very easy to miss. If you go ahead and start doing something, it's going to ignore that warning. So I'm going to go ahead and right click and open up the uh, properties for this layer. And under the um, source tab, I'm going to scroll down a bit. And we've, we see there's an option here for spatial reference, but it says unknown coordinate system. So in this case, I don't know where the data should be, and I don't know where uh, how, how to locate it, other than I know it's supposed to be in California, right? So when you come across a situation like this, the first thing I usually do is look at the extent. <clears throat> so the extent value, <clears throat> excuse me, for this data set shows the coordinates and there are coordinates associated with this data set. It just doesn't have the PRJ file that uh, identifies what coordinate system it's in. But all spatial data has, a, has an inherent coordinate system or an inherent set of coordinates that locate all of the vertices. And here are the values, the maximum and minimum east, west, north, south values. Uh, and these are in the 472,000 uh, and 3.7 million range. So this kind of gives you an idea that we're not dealing with a geographic coordinate system in latitude and longitudes because those values should range between zero and 180 and zero and 90. And we are no nowhere close to that. So this is definitely not in a geographic coordinate system. It's likely in a NAT83 um, state plane coordinate system, something else like that, maybe UTM. And so we need to figure out kind of where, where we go for that. So first, I'm going to go ahead and just apply, <clears throat> excuse me. So first, let me go, go back to my notes. I want to make sure. So these are not definite, they're, they're not decimal degree values. So let's try setting the values to feet. Let's say I set my, uh, set my coordinate system values. Right now, it's decimal degrees. But let's say I set my display values to US feet. So I can, I can change that. Now the values that are shown here, and I'm gonna zoom back to my, um, to my layer. So the, the, I know the coordinates should vary between you know, 400 some odd thousand for the, um, for the Y axis, 3.7 million for the X. And I'm, and I'm getting values here at the cursor in feet that do not agree with that. So the values that are stored with my coordinates are not in feet either. But let's go back and change this to meters. So now we're kind of we're kind of homing in, and you can see now the values that are shown here at the bottom of my screen. This is the the coordinate for the the cursor. Those values are now agreeing with the range of values for my extent, right? So now I know that the coordinates defined for this layer are in meters. So I know that the coordinate system that I should define would have a meters definition. So I'm, I'm getting better. Now I know that for this data set to appear in California, it should be in a, UT, you know, if I wanted to try a UTM coordinate system, I'd need to know the UTM zones. And lo and behold, I actually have a UTM zone layer. I'm gonna zoom out to it and I'm gonna make it, uh, a non-fill. And so California is over here in this area and it uses UTM zone 11. So I'm going to go ahead and change the uh, coordinate system for my map from the WGS 1984 web mercator. I'm going to use a UTM zone 11 data set. Oops, I'm using the wrong keyboard. 11. So I'm doing that search. And under my projected coordinate systems and UTM under NAT83, I'm going to start there because that's a modern data uh, datum. I'm going to select NAT83 UTM zone 11, click OK. <clears throat> and now it's changed the coordinate system. I'm going to go zoom back to my layer. <clears throat> And now, hey, look, it appears that I'm actually somewhere in California. 
And if you zoom in a little bit more closely, we're in Canyon Creek. So the country club up here kind of helps me understand that I'm, I'm in the right area, but I can also see that there's still a problem, right? My, my footprints are a bit off from the underlying base map. And if this was just a, a matter of being in a UTM coordinate system difference, that would be, um, that would be a, an issue and they should be aligning properly. So maybe not NAD 83, maybe NAD 80 or NAD 27. So I'm going to come back and do another search. And this time I'm going to select the NAD 27 zone 11 select that, click OK. And now my footprints are, are more, more accurately aligning with my underlying base map. So now I've determined that my layer is in uh, a, a UTM coordinate system for California NAD 27 zone 11. Uh, and I, that, so I want to create or I want to apply that coordinate system to this layer so it's no longer a mystery. And that gets us to the final thing I want to show you, which is the define projection tool. And I'm sorry, we're running right up to our time here, but I think I can get this done. So it's, it's found define projection. The, the difference between define projection and the projection tool that I ran earlier is that the projection tool actually does a calculation. It, it moves your data to a new location to, to new coordinates and assigns a different coordinate to each one of your vertices. The defined projection says, keep the coordinates as they are, but build that uh, inherent understanding of what my coordinate system should be, put that into my data set. So this tool modifies your original data set. It changes the original data. It doesn't produce an output data set, it just writes over your original data set. So for the coordinate system, I'm going to select the current map, which is map two. That's giving me this NAD27 UTM zone 11 north coordinate system. And I'm going to run that tool. And now when I go back to my coordinate or to my layer and look at my source inside the spatial reference, it's now been defined as the, the reference system. And that's saved into the, the data set that's stored outside of this map document. And so that has been a whirlwind tour. I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment so I can see you guys. And uh, thanks for hanging with me to the end. I appreciate your, uh, your patience. And I hope that this was a, uh, a helpful session. Let me share real quick the... Um, Actually, I'm gonna share my screen again so I can show you the last slide, which is additional resources. And Bruno, you were asking about the, the, um, the transformations. I would refer you to this National Geodetic Survey site from NOAA. It includes a lot of information about um, this uh, concept, uh, about how it's done in the United States and also in uh, international uh, aspects as well. Uh, the ArcMap help gives you information about this, how this is done in ArcMap. The projections working manual is a USGS uh, deep dive into projections and the mathematics behind them. The math projections comparative poster is the one that we showed uh, a simple image about selecting the proper uh, coordinate system for a, a, a map. And then the last link, which is a projections demonstration website that shows you many different projections it's, and it allows you to look at uh, the various <coughs> projections on a display. Uh, I appreciate your attention.